Are you genuinely concerned because of this red shadow? Is our nation really endangered by an evil alien force? The answer is yes. Here is a recent Reader's Digest feature article by General Carlos Romulo, ambassador from the Philippines, past president of the United Nations General Assembly. He sounds a dramatic warning. America, wake up. The editors of the Reader's Digest note, a wise and loyal friend of the United States warns us the Cold War is real war. It is far later than we know. The communists can win without changing their tactics. We cannot win without changing ours. We must assume the offensive. We dare not stand still. Yes, a time has come in the life of our country demanding the fullest citizenship service of every man and woman. The first requirement is an understanding of the true nature of world communism. To accomplish this, we must recall many bits of recent history and assemble them on the map of the world. The 20th century father of communism was Nikolai Lenin. He had a small group of followers completely dedicated to the building of an utterly new materialistic world ruled by a godless dictatorship. By 1917, they had a force of about 40,000 men trained in communist revolutionary tactics and they had infiltrated the socialist government which a few months earlier had gained power from Tsar Nicholas II. At a signal from control of the socialist government, at first Lenin and his henchmen held only the capital, but by 1922 they had extended their control with the use of infiltration and terror sufficiently to establish the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. Lenin died in 1924, but before he died, he had laid down for his followers the plan for world conquest. Paraphrased and summarized, it declared, first we will take Eastern Europe, next the masses of Asia. Then we shall encircle that last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We shall not have to attack. It will fall like an overripe fruit into our hands. No matter who has been the boss in the Kremlin at any time since 1924, the communists have always kept their eyes unwaveringly on this plan and on the strategy to carry it out. This is their blueprint today. The communist strategists have used great patience. Their technique of bit-by-bit -bit advance has been an important key to their success. They have used bribery, lies, bluff, brutality, the most extensive and most successful espionage network in world history, mass murder on a scale never before dreamed of, and every other possible means to advance them along the road to world conquest, following the blueprint laid down by Lenin. Among their greatest assets has been the lack of understanding of the true nature of international communism by the people and the leaders of the United States. The first big break for the communist conspiracy came in 1933, when the United States formally recognized the Stalin regime. The prestige of this recognition was priceless. It enabled the Soviet dictatorship to establish monetary credit and to establish embassies in America and elsewhere as bases of vital espionage operations. This recognition came at a time when Khrushchev was directing the deliberate starvation of millions of Ukrainians who were resisting communist control over their lives. Another stroke of good fortune for the ambitious communist world empire was World War II. Stalin made his notorious deal with Adolf Hitler in August of 1939, and the German panzer divisions rolled into Poland a few days later in September 1939. In just four weeks, Russia and Germany were cutting up Poland, dividing the spoils. The Reds made their next move against tiny Finland. The Finns fought courageously, but Moscow got a toehold in the little Baltic nation. Soon thereafter, the Reds infiltrated Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, taking over the three little nations from within. The Baltic people resisted, not in an organized way, but individually. Hundreds of thousands of freedom-loving people were seized, thrown into cattle cars, and sped off to Siberian slave labor camps. The Soviet timetable for conquest was interrupted when Germany turned on the Kremlin and invaded Russia. As Germany drove deep into Russia, the vast numbers of Russian fighting men with American Lend-Lease aid proved a formidable obstacle. Town strength broke the German armies. But General Patton and other on-rushing allied forces were halted from going through eastern Germany, Czechoslovakia, and the Balkans by a fateful decision of our governmental leaders. 
and the stage was set for Stalin's execution is of Lenin's master plan, the takeover of Eastern Europe. At the conclusion of the European War, the Soviets returned to their strategy of world conquest through infiltration. The pattern was revealed in Czechoslovakia, but the lesson didn't penetrate the Western mind. All the communists asked of Czech President Banesh was the establishment of a socialist economic system and the placement of a few communists as cabinet officials in a coalition government. One of the cabinet posts occupied by a communist was the Department of Interior, which controlled the police force. At a signal from Moscow, the communists in the government merely asserted full power. Banesh and Jan Masaryk, like countless other Czechs who resisted, were quietly put to death or they committed suicide. An Associated Press foreign affairs editor wrote this memorable dispatch. Jan Masaryk thought he could do business with communism. His suicide is a monument to his recognition and a warning to the world that no such course is possible. The year was 1948. The warning carries an even greater import today. Czechoslovakia did business with communists. Czechoslovakian freedom was destroyed. One by one, the nations of Eastern Europe fell, from the Baltic to the Mediterranean. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, East Prussia, and half of Poland already had been seized. Now came the remainder of Poland, plus Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania. First infiltration, then coalition government, then the takeover. The United States and Great Britain stood by, virtually silent and inactive. Our distinguished ambassador to Poland, Arthur Bliss Lane, resigned his post and put on record in his book, I Saw Poland Betrayed, what he had witnessed of communist ruthlessness and the unaccountable behavior of American and British diplomatic leadership. Ambassador Lane wrote, our policy of appeasement toward Soviet Russia undoubtedly emboldened Stalin to go ahead with his plans for the complete domination of Poland, as of all other countries in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, the communists were content for the time being to aid in the establishment of socialism as a transition stage to communism. It is important that we understand the relationship of socialism to communism. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, was a lifelong socialist. Khrushchev speaks of communism and socialism as very closely related. John Strachey, a top official in the Labour Socialist Party of Great Britain in 1950, was for many years an openly avowed communist. In his book entitled The Theory and Practice of Socialism, he wrote, it is impossible to establish communism as the immediate successor to capitalism. It is accordingly proposed to establish socialism as something which we can put in the place of our present decaying capitalism. Hence, communists work for the establishment of socialism as a necessary transition stage on the road to communism. Further dramatizing the affinity of socialism and communism is this 100th anniversary copy of the Communist Manifesto, published not by Moscow communists, but by the Labour Socialist Party of Great Britain. Yes, socialism and communism are political and ideological bedfellows. Wherever communism can't take over by fomenting internal revolt, the Reds seek to establish so-called democratic socialist governments, which they can infiltrate until the Communist Party can take over. They are working at this in every socialist nation in the world. England and the Western European nations are our allies, and we should respect them and try to generate faith in the good intentions of their people and their governments. However, the documented facts suggest that we should look with penetrating eyes and minds at the socialist activities in Europe, in Scandinavia, and around the world. After the consolidation of their gains in Eastern Europe and their deceptive penetration of Western Europe, the Soviets moved for the takeover of China, the masses of Asia, set forth as the second step in Lenin's blueprint for world conquest. They already had established a powerful communist apparatus in China, headed by Moscow-trained agents. And the concessions gained by Stalin at the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, in the absence of China's leader Chiang Kai-shek, opened the door to their strategic plan. In North China, communist Chinese armies engaged the nationalist armies under Chiang. The actual takeover of China was preceded by a worldwide communist propaganda campaign creating hate for Chiang Kai-shek and picturing Mao Zedong as a great agrarian reformer. Agitation became widespread for a truce in China and for a coalition government. 
also for a stoppage of U.S. military aid to nationalist China. President Truman sent General George Marshall to urge Chiang Kai-shek to take the communists into a coalition government in China, as President Banesh had so fatally done in Czechoslovakia. Chiang steadfastly refused. General Marshall effected a temporary truce, which in the end aided the communists. Just a few months later, in July 1946, General Marshall halted the sale of arms and ammunition to nationalist China. This was backed up with an executive order by President Truman on August 18, 1946. After the arms embargo went into effect on the forces of free China, the Chinese Reds moved into military action again, using their excellent Russian-supplied equipment from Manchuria. Some important voices in Congress questioned this tragic turn of events in China, and in the summer of 1947, Secretary of State Marshall and President Truman sent General Albert C. Wedemeyer to China for the announced purpose of making a study to determine whether the United States should rescind its embargo and give aid to Chung's military forces. General Wedemeyer recommended aiding Chung. He said that with aid, the nationalist forces could save China from falling into the grasp of international communism. But Wedemeyer's report was suppressed by presidential order. This book was finally published in 1958 after China fell to the communists. Here are the findings of a subsequent investigation by the United States Senate. The Judiciary Committee in the report it has just issued finds a conspiracy, communist-inspired, that led to American defeat. High American officials were duped. Policies were influenced that gave the communists their greatest victory. This paragraph says, the loss of China after defeat of Japan represents the greatest defeat in U.S. history. Few Americans read this shocking report, but some political personages were aroused. John F. Kennedy, at the time a congressman from Massachusetts, spoke out, Over these past few days, we have learned the extent of the disasters befalling China and the United States. Our policy in China has reaped the whirlwind. The continued insistence that aid would not be forthcoming unless a coalition government with the communists was formed was a crippling blow to the national government. This is the tragic story of China, whose freedom we once fought to preserve. What our young men had saved, our diplomats and our president had frittered away. This statement was reported in the February 21st, 1949 Congressional Record. President Kennedy must not forget this speech. In the decade just past, the Chinese communists have strengthened their hold by executing their opposition, people owning two or three acres of land who resisted communist collectivization and the breakup of their families. The dead, more than 20 million. The Russians call it liquidation. The Chinese call it seomei, which means deprived of existence. To grasp the meaning of this, we must transpose it closer to home. These executions would wipe out the entire population of these 13 states. One by one, the smaller nations of Southeast Asia have either fallen into the communists' hands or have been very deeply penetrated by the fifth column. In Tibet, the Reds have murdered thousands and established a bloody reign of terror. It gives horrible evidence of the fate awaiting the remaining masses of Asia. The China victory paved the way for the next Red move from Manchuria into North Korea, where the communists infiltrated and quickly took over the government. Then, equipped with war material from Russia and communist China, the Reds moved down upon Syngman Rhee's little half-nation of South Korea. By almost any military or diplomatic measuring stick, the United States lost the Korean War. The American commanders who served in Korea during the actual fighting returned home crushed and bitter.